We've actually been on the road to this science test for quite some time. Back in 2017, the first practice tests came out for this cast. And it was first implemented just once back in 2019. And you can actually go online and get the test results by clicking on this link here. Uh, and we'll put the link in the YouTube video as well. 2020, the test was, of course, canceled for COVID. Uh, and in 2021, it was optional, but many districts chose not to take it. This time around, it's optional in 2022, but many districts are actually choosing to take it so they can really get back on track with their science teaching. And of course, coming soon, in a couple years, the CAS scores are going to be added to the state dashboard so that you'll be able to see uh, right there alongside of ELI and math just how well your students are doing in science. The most important thing to recognize about this test is that it is cumulative. So if you've been thinking about this as an eighth grade test, that's no longer the way you want to be thinking about it. That is an all middle school test. And if you are thinking about it in terms of high school, this is a, for all high school standards. If you're a physics teacher, this test covers chemistry, physics, life science, and earth and space science. And if you're a fifth grade teacher, it's not just a test for you. It's a test of all K-5 standards, or actually, if you look at my little caveat here, it's actually the grades three to five PEs uh, with foundational info from K-2. The other caveat for everybody is that it's not actually all the standards because that would be way too much to include in one test. So they actually sample out one third of the standards each year, selected it randomly uh, from the full menu. So you still get the full breadth, but you don't have to handle absolutely everything in one sitting. What types of questions are you going to have on the cast? Well, there's 30 to 40 discrete items. Those are computer scored items that just stand one question by themselves and don't link together from question to question. And the number that you have, whether you're at the 30 range or the 40 range, it depends upon uh, whether you're uh, in the elementary level or up to the high school level. The tests get longer. In addition to these computer scored discrete items, there also are three to four performance tasks. Now, these are still delivered by the computer, but there are six items together based upon a single scenario that connect to one another. Usually one to two of those are free response questions, where students type in one paragraph or so for each one of them. And there is a performance task for life science, one for earth science, and one for physical science. So all three of these have, are represented in there. Now, the way that they divide this up is that there's these questions that are designed for breadth. That's primarily the discrete items. The performance tasks are all the depth ones. And like I said, one for each life, earth, and physical science. And then there's also a third category of questions that are not included in your student scores, where test makers are trying things out. Uh, these are called their field test items. And they're actually hidden within the others. So you can't exactly be sure when you're looking at a question whether this is one that's experimental by the test makers or whether it's actually going to count. They're all mixed together. You might be wondering, does the test emphasize any topic more than others? And the answer is no. This is a cumulative test that covers everything. I think I mentioned that. And all three science disciplines get an equal number of items. And you can see that here in this table, uh, an equal number of discrete items and exactly one performance task from each subject area. And you can find out more by uh, clicking on the CAST 2020 blueprint. At the end of this, you're going to get a score report, which is divided up into color-coded uh, categories of performance, just like all the other state tests in California, like ELA and math, uh, where either you've not met the standard, you're nearly met the standard, you've met it, or you've exceeded it. Uh, and so you'll get that level for your school. Here's my son's school at Holmes Middle School in LAUSD, and their eighth graders uh, had you know about the same number of people uh, exceeding the, or meeting or exceeding the standard as the state of California average, and they're a little bit higher than the district uh, average there. In addition to this school-wide number, you'll also get a breakdown based upon how well students are doing uh, within each of those branches of science, the life science branch, the physical science, and the earth and space science branch. Now, that's all we get in terms of breakdowns. There's no information broken down about how well we're teaching specific SEPs or CCCs or any specific content in there. Even if you're in uh, high school and you know that there's physical science, physics and chemistry are grouped together in the score reports. So you're not even going to get any breakdown on, on the division between that. Uh, so it's not necessarily the most actionable item uh, that you can get from this score report.
One other thing I want to emphasize, it's kind of the same one I've been emphasizing all along, is that these tests are cumulative. And that means that the score reports are not designed for individual teachers to see how well they did. These are school-wide results that reflect the cumulative teaching of many different teachers within the grades, whether that's K-5 if you're in elementary, or 6-8 in middle school, or all the different courses that the students have taken in high school. Well, I've got some bad news for us, and that is that we can't teach to this test. And that's because the test writers were explicitly instructed to present their students uh, with phenomena they're unlikely to have seen before. And I have this sort of joke here. This is not a real cast question, but I think it really communicates the spirit of things. So we have this little picture here, and they might be shown a picture like this and say, how might the butterlope's ears help it survive, grow, or reproduce? And of course, your students have never seen a butterlope before because, well, it doesn't exist. Uh, but... Uh, what would your students do? How would they bring to bear all of their understanding of science in order to answer this question? So that's what we need to focus on. And that's the good news. You actually can teach to this test. And that's because every one of these test items probes at least two of the NGSS dimensions, the science and engineering practices, the disciplinary core ideas, and the cross-cutting concepts. In other words, two-thirds of this test is stuff that we absolutely know what's on it. It's the SEPs and the CCCs. And if you come back for our CAST 103, we're really going to dig in a little bit deeper to that. Right now, let's take a, a short preview of it, though, that students are likely going to encounter topics they've not covered in class. So what do we need to be able to prepare them? We need to teach them data analysis. And let's take a look at what that looks like on the CAST. Here's an example of a middle school performance task in physical science. This is about an imaginary classroom investigation into the factors affecting the formation of impact craters. So even if your students have never done impact craters, there's still information in here that they're going to be able to get, get about this scenario. And this is typical for the performance tasks where we have a whole lot of context that sets up this problem. And then on the right side, we start beginning the specific things that we need to know for this particular question. Uh, they have a table here showing uh, the results of the investigation that the student collected, including different trials, the mass, the speed, the depth. And then we get to the question itself. Construct the graph that best shows the results of the investigation by selecting the independent x-axis and the dependent y-axis variables from the table. And so you might be able to drag mass onto the correct axis or speed or depth, whichever ones you think they are. So take a moment to look through this problem, see if you can answer it, and then we'll go on from there. Here's another middle school example. This time it's one of the discrete items, one that stands on its own, uh, and this is from Earth and Space Science. But it really is testing abilities to understand how models depict things. So a student created this model of the water cycle, and we're supposed to look at this and then say, based on the model, what should the students say about the role of living organisms? I'll give you a few minutes to read through these and then come back and, I'll, and we'll talk about it. Well, is it true that animals create pathways in the mountains that allow water to flow downhill? Yes, that does some, that is something that happens in nature. But what we're trying to do is not just test our understanding of natural processes, but this is actually a test of how well students can read a model and see what's depicted in it. And if you look here, here are our animals, and they are not located in the mountains in this particular model. So what really we want to do is be making sure that we are using in this model, and the only one of these things that is correct that is in this model is the transpiration process. So students need to know what transpiration is. That's when plants move water into the, from the soil into the atmosphere, and they need to be able to see that that's the only thing that's shown in this model. So a little bit of DCI knowledge and a little bit of model reading abilities. Here's another discrete item uh, depicted from the physical sciences, also in middle school. And here we've got nitrogen gas reacting with hydrogen gas to form ammonia. And we've got a depiction of those in terms of a pictorial model. Now, maybe your students have never seen ammonia before, and maybe that's a chemical reaction you haven't studied. But that's okay, because what we really are looking for is which model correctly shows the mass being conserved in the reaction. Again, go ahead and look at that, and then come back and I'll talk about it with you. This way of depicting individual molecules by atoms together and trying to talk about how a chemical reaction always involves the same number of atoms that you start with as you end with. 
And so if we look through these, it's actually pretty easy to do if you just look at the blue ones and you can see, ah, there's two and one, that doesn't match up. You start with two and you end with one, that doesn't match up. Here we start with two and end with two. Uh, that is a candidate for us. And at the bottom right here, this one here that starts with two, uh, four, sorry, starts with four and ends with two. Uh oh, that's not going to be a match. And so then we could go through and count up all the little white ones and make sure, and indeed, everything that we start with, we end with. And this is how this model depicts that information. The last big thing that uh, is kind of unusual about this test is that our students will need to write explanations. And here's an example from the high school test this time uh, for life science. And here we have a story about a paramecium. It's a single-celled freshwater organism that can be observed using a microscope. And even if you've never seen a paramecium before, there's a little bit of a picture there to provide some information. And then it tells you about a, a laboratory investigation to study population growth. And students are looking at this graph. Uh, and the carrying capacity is the number of individuals that the environment has enough resources to support. So even if your students don't remember that term, it's actually given to them here. But what they have to do next is look at the graph, look at the population size over time, and then explain why the paramecium population growth is really rapid at the part labeled A, and why the population growth is slower at the part labeled B. What's going on there? Where is the population at, it, at its carrying capacity? Uh, and go ahead and tell us about how it gets there. And students are going to write one or two paragraphs in here to respond. So let's get to it. Let's have you try this out with your students. You can click on this link or scan this uh, QR code here and go to a place where you can try out a sample test. Now, you have the option of doing a couple of different tests. One is called the CAST training test, and that's a short. It has just one question of each type, so you can kind of get a flavor and make sure that you have a, can load things up and use the interface. And the other one is the CAST practice test, shown in the more salmon-y color, and that's a full-length test for your grade level. And as you're looking through the list that's on this page here, make sure you get your correct grade level, but also look for the CAST, not the CAA science test. That is a different test. That's the alternate assessment for those folks that have IEPs and other special needs. Because there are only two tests for each grade level to try out, one idea to get your students a little bit more practice is to, if you're a middle school teacher, uh, go ahead and have your students try the fifth grade test, either the training test uh, or the practice test. And same thing with high school students. Have them try that CAST training test uh, for middle school and then the CAST practice test so they can see how long a full length test is. Let's go ahead and walk through what it looks like when you're actually on that site. The very first thing you can do is just go ahead and hit the green sign-in button. Your students can do that directly. There's no and nothing you have to change there. Choose your grade level. And if I want to try out the middle school test, I'll hit that 8. I'll scroll on down till I find, let's see, oh, there's science, but that's not the right one. That's the CAA science test. That's the CAA science test. Here we go. Here's the CAST practice test and the CAST training test. And I'm going to go ahead and start with that training test here. And you can see that I can turn on different uh, presentation modes, including switching myself to Spanish or Braille, uh, the ASL options. These are all things that your site administrator can turn on for you, uh, but you won't be able to actually turn on for individual students. That needs to be done before the student sits down to take the test by your individual site administrator. Um, there's some literacy assistance resources as well. Same, same deal with some of these assistive technologies here. And uh, right now for us to try out for just our, our sort of typical student, we're just going to go ahead and hit the green button right away to accept all the defaults. Every time you do it, you need to hit the sound and video playback option here and confirm to the computer that you could hear that sound. Uh, and then go ahead and begin the test now. And as you do that, you can start seeing all these different types of questions where you can drag and drop things on here. And to go to the next question, gosh, where is it that I go to the next question? That's actually up here at the top, kind of a weird spot. Uh, and here we are with our question about uh, meteor impacts that we saw before. And you can see how we go ahead and select for the variables that we wanted on each of the axes and then hit the Run button. It shows us a graph. And then because this is a performance task, it's going to have a question that asks us to read the graph and uh, interpret that and choose which one we think is the best interpretation. And I just clicked on one. I didn't pay attention to it. When you're done with that one, you can hit the Next button. And so you're keeping using that Next button at the top, choosing different answers. And it says, oops, I didn't answer all the questions on this screen. And this 
this particular one, I actually can click on each of these little spots right here. So finding out exactly how to answer the question can be a little bit tricky sometimes. I really encourage you to take that practice test with your students, and then you can even show them that uh, they don't even need to remember the formulas. There's a button up here where they can download a formula sheet. So it's all about what you can do with the science and not what you can remember or memorize about science.